Welcome to Founders Metropolitan Community Church. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Along with our Sunday worship, Founders MCC offers a rich assortment of personal and spiritual enrichment classes, a variety of activities, and a number of support groups to help us grow along the way. Don't forget to visit the information and welcome table in the courtyard today or pick up one of the Connections flyers to find out more. Please don't miss out on the information and announcements in your bulletin, which will make your connection with Founders more meaningful. Check out our website, mccla.org. And find us also on Facebook. And join us in making Founders MCC your one-stop spiritual portal. This is your first Sunday at Founders. You are our guest. We would like to extend an especially warm welcome. After today's worship service, please join us for refreshments in the courtyard. Visit the Welcome and Information Center. And meet some new friends. We'd love to answer your questions, give you a tour of the building, or serve you a cup of coffee. Or a cup of tea. In just a few moments, the ushers will pass out our welcome tablet. We want everyone to sign in today and let us know how we can best serve you. If you're joining us online, we want to hear from you as well. Look for the check-in information on the homepage of our website. And let us know that you're joining us. Founders MCC is a place of diverse and welcome. A place of healing and acceptance. A place of deep spirituality and transformation. A place of joy and love. Welcome to Founders Metropolitan Community Church, Los, Los Angeles. Angeles.
God is altogether wonderful to you. Would you join me in a hand praise as we come to worship? <laughs> Friends, last Sunday we lit the first candle on our Advent wreath. And today we will light the second candle. It is the candle of peace. So I'd invite the usher, if possible, to come and to light this candle this morning. We light it knowing full well that peace is elusive. And in some parts of the world, it is almost completely absent. Yet in this Advent season, we trust that God is never absent from us. God is always preparing something new. And even where there is war and discord, whether between countries, within families, or within our own hearts, God is present, gently leading us to new possibilities. And so we light these candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace. And we light this second candle, not just in remembrance of the peace that we pray for in the world, but we light this candle in memory of Nelson Mandela, who knew how to bring peace to the world, who demonstrated clearly peace in his own life, even in the face of great adversity. For he knew that the ways of peace were stronger than the ways of war, that the ways of forgiveness were more important than the ways of bitterness and hatred, and encourages us this morning as we remember his life and salute him for his new possibilities, that it is not just about his life, but it's about ours, about finding forgiveness for our neighbor, about finding the ways of peace over and over and over again. So may his life echo through the generations just as the life of Christ impacts us this morning so that we too might light candles for hope and for peace. Pray with me this morning. Loving God, in the time of preparation and planning, we thank you for hope and peace that you unfailingly offer us. Show us the creative power of hope. Teach us the peace that comes from justice demonstrated through the lives of many and in the life of Nelson Mandela. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you this day that we might live in the light of Christ. Amen. God bless you this morning. Please be seated. It is, as always, a joy to welcome you to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. A, a little crisp and a little cooler than we're used to in Los Angeles, but it's nice and warm in here, uh, not just because the heating is on, but because the Spirit of the living Christ is amongst us. And so we glow in that light this morning. I want to welcome you, especially if you are worshiping with us for the very first time this morning. Uh, we know that you have a choice in worshiping communities, but we are so glad that you are with us this morning. I wonder if you would indulge my spirit, if indeed you're with us for the very first time today. I wonder if you would just raise your hand and keep it up for a moment so that we can see you, so that we can welcome you to worship this morning. Our ushers will get to you, but please do accept this flower and a welcome pack as our way of acknowledging your presence amongst us. You truly are our guest, and we want to make your visit here as meaningful as possible. Uh, so please do avail yourself of the information that's in your welcome pack. Uh, please get connected with us, and if you are looking for a spiritual home, uh, we sincerely hope that you may have found it with us this morning. We are glad that you are here. 
We also want to welcome especially those who are worshiping with us live on the internet this morning. Uh, we broadcast our services live every Sunday morning and every Sunday afternoon, and we know that many people from around the world gather with us, uh, both uh, virtually and sometimes during the week, just to uh, have their regular fix of what it means to be a spiritual being in this world. And so we are glad to welcome you this morning. Our ushers uh, have or will be passing out our welcome pack, so a uh, welcome uh, brochure, so please do sign in for us this morning. <laughs> Uh, do let us know that you've been present. And if you are worshiping with us online this morning, on the home page, you will find a little button that we encourage you to uh, click on right now uh, so that you can sign in for us. Please let us know that you've been present. And uh, for those of us in our worship space this morning, uh, if you want to later on, go back to our website and just click that button and you will see the variety and number of people that worship with us from all over the world on a Sunday morning, uh, giving thanks for what we get to do here every Sunday. Um, and offering a way of thanksgiving uh, to the God that is with them where perhaps there are no open and affirming congregations uh, or certainly where there may not be a metropolitan community church. Uh, so we are glad to welcome each and every one of us into this space this morning. As you came in, the ushers would have given you your order of worship, and on the front you will find the order of today's service, and inside you will find lots more information about our church and how we can make your visit today more meaningful, uh, that all of our announcements are inside. Uh, we don't uh, usually do announcements on a Sunday morning anymore, so please do uh, take these home and mark on your own calendars the ministries and events and programs that you would like to become a part of and to get connected with. Uh, so please do that for me. Uh, it really is important that we build community here at Founders Metropolitan Community Church, so we are glad that you are here. It's also uh, good to see some folks who have been away for a few weeks. Uh, they're returning to us, and we're glad that you are here and others who are visiting from out of town. Uh, so it really is good to see all of you as we come into worship this morning. Uh, just a couple of very brief things for you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, offer a deep appreciation to uh, Larry Mode and to Jonathan Carlisle and to Bruce Gibella, uh, who spent a couple of days uh, this week decorating the church for us for Christmas, and uh, I think you'll agree it's tastefully done. I know that uh, they would like to solicit your help. Um, we are not finished uh, with the decorating. Those of you who have been around uh, at Christmas time, we know that as we get closer to Christmas, uh, we add pieces to it. Uh, the next piece that will be added, of course, is the poncettias for Christmas. Um, and so you can help if you would like to dedicate a poncettia uh, for Christmas uh, in memory of or in giving thanks for something that's happened in your life, uh, please do so. Uh, you can do that with Robin in the courtyard directly after worship. Uh, poncettias are $15 for one or $25 for two. Um, and all of the dedications for the Ponsettias will be in a special Christmas Eve um, and Christmas Day bulletin. So please do that. Uh, and that will help us just to uh, uh, finalize. We have a Ponsettia Christmas tree uh, that usually sits over here. And it's very beautiful and it's very attractive. And we want to make sure that that's filled and not has some spots left in it. So you can help us by doing that. Also this week, uh, we begin our new project, uh, Laundry Love. Uh, that's a new project that we're doing in conjunction with Holy Spirit Episcopal Church uh, here in uh, Hollywood. Um, it's an opportunity for us to be of service again in our community. And on the second Tuesday of every month, uh, we'll be taking over the laundry on the corner of Edgemont and Hollywood Boulevards. Um, and we'll be providing uh, quarters for the machines and soap. Um, and a little bit of fellowship time for the working poor um, and for those who are homeless in our community, for them to come and to do their laundry for free. Um, so uh, we're glad to be partnering with Holy Spirit Fellowship, uh, Holy Spirit Episcopal Church, I should say. Um, and we'll be adding a couple of other congregations over the next few months. But this uh, Tuesday is our launch. Um, and if you would like to volunteer for that, uh, we invite you to show up at that laundry um, at 6 o'clock in the evening. Doors will open to, uh, uh, to our guests um, at 7, uh, but we'll be there at 6 to make sure that we prepare everything. And uh, we, we know that we are just offering a little bit of dignity to those who perhaps um, when they put on a clean shirt or a clean brow, blouse or something else, uh, we know that that just lifts our self-esteem. I don't know about you, but I know what that feels like on a Sunday morning when I put that clean shirt on. Um, something <laughs> happens to my spirit. And so um, we're going to be doing that for the working poor and for the homeless in our community, uh, adding to the very many different programs that we have in our community for the homeless. Uh, so your support is greatly appreciated. It's one of the things that we get to do together 
um, as Founders Metropolitan Community Church. So thank you so much for keeping us on track with that project, and we're looking forward to launching that uh, on Tuesday of this week. So we've come into worship where we've uh, assembled ourselves. Uh, we bring ourselves now fully and wholly as we bring a sense of peace to one another and to ourselves. And so I invite you now to turn to one another and offer a sign of peace and welcome. We're in the right place this morning. God bless you. Scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 1, 17 through 25, from the New International Version. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's the time of the 22nd Winter Olympic Games in Sochi, and Russia is in turmoil. Harsh anti-LGBT laws have been passed. Homophobic attacks are on the rise. There are even laws being proposed that would remove children from the homes of lesbian and gay parents and ban gay men from contracting surrogate mothers. That's why my friends and I are in trouble. I'm Joseph, and this is my partner, Alexander. Call me Sasha. <laughs> our surrogate mother is about to have our baby. And it's not safe for us to stay in Russia. But now she's trying to back out. I'm Christina, and it's not that I want to back out. I'm scared. I've never been away from home before. You see, Sasha is speaking at an academic conference in Bethlehem. A perfect chance to make a run for it. Oh, and me? I'm Gabby, lesbian mom, activist, and resident confidence builder. 
My partner and I were planning to take our kids and leave the country at the same time, but it may be harder than we thought. I guess I'd better get there. Thanks for coming, Gabby. What a mess. I, I said she was too young. <laughs> Welcome to parenthood. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. You're going to be a father in just a few days. I suggest you get over yourself. Well, if Martina thinks she's got an escape clause, maybe I should get one too. I think I'd rather stay here with a picket sign getting my head bashed in than going on this crazy adventure. Are you nervous about changing the world or changing the diapers? That's a good question. Gobby, I am so glad you're here. I've been thinking. You know, getting to Bethlehem for the conference is one thing, but what if I don't come out of it with a job offer from away from Russia? Sasha, honey, you're brilliant. You'll get it. Oh, I love you too, Joseph. But Gabby, this is... I didn't think you'd come. Can you forgive me for being such a coward? Come on, Martina. You're full of strong stuff. It's no accident that you stand out among all the upcoming young activists, and you're doing something that's going to be propelling our movement to the next level. The responsibility is absolutely terrifying. It's not like you're alone, Martina. When you make a bold move like this, something bigger than you are takes over. An action just like this when the time is ripe, well, it's just huge. A liberating event that catches on everywhere. You know, I think we needed to hear that too. Joseph Darling, you know, you are going to be a great father. <laughs> and you are gonna bowl them over in Bethlehem. Okay, you're all magnifying my strength. I'll go. If all of you believe I can pull this off, I can do it. All right then, let's finish packing and head for the airport while the Olympic tourists and the protesters are mixing it up. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> um, hello? <coughs> yes. They're asking for Martina. Nobody knows I'm here, I swear. Hello, this is Martina. Aunt Elizaveta? Where did you get this number? What are you talking about? What do you mean the authorities were there? So over the next four weeks, we're going to be uh, seeing more of this play. It's an opportunity for us to remain connected with this Christmas story an opportunity for us to use Advent perhaps a little differently than we have in the past. Those of you who have been around churches in the past will know that uh, usually in the Advent season we light the four Advent candles and we talk about joy and about peace and hope and love and they are great values and they are great things to lift up in this season of Advent. But the staff encouraged me to think out of the box a little bit for this year and to think about how we might celebrate Advent together a little differently. And so our sermon series for this uh, Advent series is Christmas Through Many Eyes. And looking at Christmas through the eyes of those who are part of the story, but also encouraging us to think about those eyes as they appreciate and as they are meaningful to us uh, in the year 2013 as we move on into 2014. So I sincerely hope that you will engage with this sermon series, that you will find Advent to be a little different experience for you this year. Uh, that's not meaning that we're not going to be celebrating the birth of Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the world. Of course, that we are going to be doing that, but it's a, a way for us to contextualize and to contemporize the Christmas story for us today. So I hope that you will appreciate what we've also been doing. I want to thank Lucia Chappelle, who's, been, who's written these epilogues for us over the next few weeks. And uh, I also want you to encourage you to uh, look at the photo exhibit uh, that will be, it's on the back wall, there's more being added over the next few weeks, uh, but just to help us see Christmas or to see Christmas through different eyes this year. So as we come to open this series, would you pray with me? A God who comes to us in so many different ways, Emmanuel, God with us. A God that was with the prophets of old, a God that was with Mary and Joseph, a God that was with the shepherds and the wise ones, the God that was with those who have been in the generations before us is now present with us as we bring ourselves into this sacred space, into this church, into this community. And so we ask that the 
the eyes of God that are with us and around us and live now in us would be the eyes in which we see Christmas this year. It enables us to see them with eyes of wonder, of doubt, of grace, of love, of anger, that we might see how we can make Christmas come alive for us this year. So open our hearts and our minds now, O oh God, as we come into this place of worship, as we center ourselves so that we might hear you and receive this word that would transform our lives and transform this world. And now, loving and gracious one, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. So this morning we begin this sermon series by looking at uh, Joseph, uh, one of the characters of the biblical story of Mary and Joseph. Joseph was the one who was uh, uh, betrothed to be married to Mary. Now, there are certain things that we need to know about these characters in order for us to contextualize where they were coming from and what, they, what role they played in the story. First of all, Joseph was, as far as we know, uh, a much, much older man than Mary. Uh, not many people think about that today. We usually see relationships through our own eyes and through the contemporary world. Uh, many of us would, you know, would, would see those relationships, um, uh, the cougar or the, uh, uh, the daddy, you know, those sorts of, uh, the, where, where one is much older than the other. I, was that wrong to say, Lucia? I don't know. She just said he didn't really say that. Um, but, you know, we, we see relationships as kind of different than they did 2,000 or more years ago. Certainly in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Nazareth and in the old Judea, uh, relationships, uh, the marriage was not so much about love. It was about uh, the commitment to a woman. It was about enabling a woman to have some standing in society. Um, and Joseph, as far as we know, is much, much older than Mary. Um, in fact, if you look at Scripture, there aren't many places where Joseph is actually mentioned. Uh, in fact, in the narrative of the Christmas story, there are probably just two places. This first place when Joseph is being confronted by the reality that this one that he's betrothed to be married to um, is with child. Um, and then in the nativity, which is part of what we have become a part of a tradition in many of us, and I'm sure many of you played nativity characters when you were younger, uh, but the nativity story when Joseph is the one that goes and uh, knocks on the door of all of the places trying to find a place for them to, uh, to sleep when they get to, uh, uh, to Bethlehem. And so Joseph doesn't appear too often in Scripture. Joseph is, as far as we know, a carpenter. Um, although there have been some revelations just recently that perhaps Joseph wasn't necessarily a carpenter, but a stonemason. Um, and so we don't know exactly what he did for a living, but what we do know is that Joseph uh, was pretty well respected in his community and probably would have been very well respected by those who knew him and surrounded him. Now, Nazareth is a tiny little place. It's a village. Uh, and so certainly all the people in the village, if we just accept that Joseph was um, a craftsman, uh, we could say he was a carpenter, whatever it was that he did for a living, we know that all the people in that village would have gone to him at one time or another for something that they needed in their life. And so Joseph, a much, much older man, a craftsman, someone in their village, uh, would have been respected by all of those folks. In fact, I'm sure that he would have known the stories of the lives of many of those in his village. You know, any one of us who've been to a craftsman and you get into a conversation, you know that we allow things of our own lives to come out as we're talking with one another. And so Joseph would have known these folks, probably well respected by these folks. Uh, we don't know whether Joseph had been married before or not, but we do know that Joseph and Mary are betrothed to be married. Now, there's a difference between betrothal and marriage. We would kind of say um, engaged today. Uh, we talk about our fiancé. Uh, but in Jewish law, betrothal was just a little bit more than uh, uh, engagement. There was some law that would have ensured that they had got married. And, uh, and so Joseph and Mary are in this kind of getting to know each other period. Uh, their relationship was arranged, and so they had come in to get to know one another. Now, there probably was some excitement in Nazareth. Small village. Here we are, Mary and Joseph are going to get married. There's a big party going on. 
Um, and there would have been some investiture from the people who were a part of their lives invested in helping to celebrate them. You can imagine, uh, just as it is in any church, when we get people who are going to get married um, or there's life changes in people's lives uh, to the better, we all get involved and we all get to celebrate and we all get to be a part of that. And I'm sure in Nazareth there was some great energy around this marriage that's going to take place. Uh, certainly for, for Mary, I'm sure that the community were really pleased that she was going to get a good husband, uh, someone that was going to be able to take care of her. And for Joseph, as an older man, I'm sure that there were many who were just delighted that he was going to be married to Mary. And so here we have Mary and Joseph betrothed to be married. Uh, everything seems to be going along quite nicely. And then suddenly, Mary shows up and says, I got something to tell you. I'm pregnant. Now, in the culture of their day, the way, the, the way in which uh, they would, would come together with one another is that Mary would have had to have been a virgin, untouched by anyone else. And so Joseph and Mary, I'm sure, who were just excited about this journey that they were about to go on, and now Mary has to divulge something in her life that I'm sure Joseph looked on and went, Really? And, and I'm sure that Joseph, at that point, uh, was a little disappointed, uh, to say the least. A little disappointed about this fact that he now had been in this arrangement, and now it seems as if the arrangement is falling apart. I'm sure that there were many, many moments when Joseph had doubt about where this relationship was going. I, not, I'm unsimilar to many of us in our own humanity today, that when we are all gung-ho in a relationship, we're all gung-ho in where it's going, and suddenly someone drops something into the mix that you did not expect. Any one of us had that happen to us in our lives? And I'm sure that in those moments, we too express our own doubt about where this is going about whether we can fulfill the responsibilities that we have been saying we want to fulfill all this time. And Joseph was no different to us. Joseph had those moments of doubt, those moments of, where is this really going? And, and not only did he have to deal with this reality, but then he has Mary saying to Joseph that what is conceived in me is by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not because I've been uh, unfaithful to you. It's because God has shown up in me. Really? <laughs> really? I, I wonder what it might feel like for some of us if we were told that. You know, I kind of think in my own imagination and uh, I'm dating a woman. I know I have to stretch a lot in my imagination, but... <laughs> But, you know, let me stretch, just go there for a moment. And, uh, you know, thinking that I'm dating a woman, it's not impossible. Oh, somebody just said to me, really? <laughs> so, you know, I believe in miracles. <laughs> so, you know, so I'm dating a woman. And, uh, you know, suddenly she tells me that she is pregnant. And I have not been, I've been a good boy. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm sure I would be having my doubts. And so scripture tells us that Joseph is visited himself by an angel of God in a dream and is told by the angel, do not be afraid to take Mary home with you. For what is conceived in her is by the power of the Holy Spirit and she will give birth and she'll give birth to a son, and you shall call that son Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And imagine what Joseph must have felt like when he woke up from that dream. I, I'm sure that as he woke up, he kind of was perhaps a little bit more centered, that even in the midst of his own doubt, that he was convicted that he needed to continue with the dream, to continue with the promise that even in the midst of all of the doubts of, of where it was going or what it was going to look like or what the outcome of all this would be, that he had some conviction in his life that the reality was that he needed to keep going with the dream, to keep going with his passion. 
and to keep going with what he knew in his own spirit was truthful and that was what was right. I don't know about you, but I have some allegiance with Joseph this morning. And there are many times, and I'm sure in your own life, where you too have woken up from a dream knowing that what your life is and where it is going and what you are doing and the circumstances of it are the ways in which God is ministering to you, the way in which God is leading you. And even though people around you might think you are crazy, and even if the people around you might think that you have lost your mind, that there is a much, much better way out of a situation you have decided that this is what God is calling you to do and this is what you must do. Even in the midst of your own doubt, there is a time when God shows up in each and every one of us and says, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the holy thing. You're doing the blessed thing. And you might not know the outcome. You might not know what tomorrow will bring. But your responsibility is to follow the ways of God, to follow the ways in which God is showing up in your life right at this very moment. You see, for Joseph, he woke up from a dream. I think sometimes we think that the angels visited everybody in Nazareth that day all at the same time and said, no, no, what Joseph and Mary are saying is true. But no. The angels didn't show up to tell everybody. They just showed up to Joseph in a dream. He still had to wake up the next day to the reality of the people who were around him. I'm sure that there were the relatives and the in-laws who were saying, oh, get out of this. Move on. Find some other virgin. Do something else. They still did not hear and did not know the will and purpose of God in Joseph and Mary's life. But Joseph, in the midst of his doubt, in the midst of the doubt that surrounded him, in the midst of all of that, held the conviction of what God was doing in his life at that moment. How many of us have we had people who've surrounded us and have caused more doubt in our lives about whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Have been those angels... <laughs> who perhaps aren't the friends at that time, or perhaps they felt they were being the friend and have tried to put us off course of what we truly believed and were inspired to know that God was doing in our lives. In our play today, we heard from a group of folks who were doing something different, who could have been convicted, who could have, been, could have had so much doubt. We heard how they could have found another way, done something different, had every reason to excuse themselves from being pioneers in the world, about bringing causes to the next level in their lives. And even when they had the opportunity to run and to get out and to move on, there was this conviction that what they were doing was bigger than anything that they could possibly imagine. I'm sure Nelson Mandela had doubts about how much he was changing the world. I'm sure he sometimes saw the world through eyes of doubt, just like Joseph. Eyes of doubt, 20 more years in prison. 20 more years of what that had done to his spirit crushed him. I'm sure that there were folks around him all the time who said, do it a different way. Get out while the going is getting good. Find another way of bringing about a change in the world. But Nelson Mandela kept strong to the convictions of his spirit. Even when others doubted, even when friends turned against him, he kept strong to what he believed God was doing with him in his life. He saw the world through eyes of doubt and stepped one by one by one, step by step by step, following what he believed God was doing in his life. And I am convinced that Nelson Mandela did not know, did not know the impact he would have on the world. Joseph did not know the impact 
of being in that faithful relationship, following through on the promises that he had made to Mary, following through, even in the midst of doubt, he followed through and kept his eye on the prize, kept his eye on what God was doing in his life at that moment. We have great lessons for us this morning as we see eyes of doubt, as we see the eyes of doubt when we doubt ourselves, when we see eyes of doubt that would doubt our experience. Do you realize just being in this church this morning, you are changing the world? You're changing the world, not just for us in this gathering, but you're changing the world for those who are able to worship with us online, for those who don't have an open and affirming place to go to, for those who don't have a metropolitan community church in their local community, you're changing the world by showing up this morning. You're showing up and being present and proving to the world, even when the world might look at us with eyes of doubt, wondering whether we could truly have a relationship with God or not, you are showing up and showing over and over again that the world's doubts will be the prophecy that will lead the world to a hopeful resolution and the ways of peace and the ways of justice. We are changing the world as we follow God's voice in our hearts and minds, even when others say that we are foolish. For the second year in a row, Isaiah and I, actually this is the first year we've done together, but for the second year in a row, I've been able to be at the annual tree lighting of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the Santa Monica Boulevard Temple. I, I want to tell you, as someone who grew up LDS, as someone who has been in the LDS system, to be there uh, two years in a row as an openly gay man with his partner, I would tell you, you were foolish. If you'd have told me five years ago when we were marching around the temple in protest of 2008 in the Prop 8 marketplace, if you'd have told me that five years later they would be inviting two openly gay men into the temple for the lighting of their Christmas tree and not to, to hide ourselves but to be public as a gay couple, I would have said, I'm going to doubt your existence. I'm going to doubt that this could really change the world, but I want to tell you, being faithful and showing up, even when friends have said to me, why on earth are you going? Why on earth are you going? Aren't you betraying the cause because of what you're doing? I've had people say that to me. I've had people say to me, I, don't, I, I think you are betraying us by going to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They've doubted that I should even go there, but I've realized that it's not about me. It's about the greater cause. It's about finding the ways of justice and peace and about being present because that's what God is calling us to do. Just to show up on our promises. Just as Mayor Joseph showed up on his promise. Just as those in Russia at the moment are protesting what's going on there and we're showing up in the promise of freedom and liberty for all of God's people. I want to tell you, it was such an honor to stand there in the temple and to see those lights go on. It must have cost them a fortune, but it was great to watch <laughs> and great to participate and great that I, as someone who grew up LDS and had to deny who I was, to be able to stand there and to say, I am who I am and to have that joy, even though they may not fully accept and embrace, they are on their journey to where God is leading them. Never underestimate the impact of one life and one purpose, even in the midst of doubt. Never underestimate. We saw it in Joseph. We see it in Jesus. We see it in prophets that have come after, and we see it in Nelson Mandela. And we see it in each and every one of us as we hold true, even in the midst of doubt, we hold true to what God is doing in our own lives. I pray that through this season of Advent, we might see Christmas through different eyes, not just as a nice story that happened 2,000 years ago, but a story that continues to be in you and me. A story that continues to compel us to follow the dream, to follow the passion, 
to follow what we believe God is calling us to do, even when others might call us crazy, even when we might think we are crazy, but to follow our passion. For it is in that following of the passion that God shows up over and over and over and over again. And we see the world transformed because we followed the passion. May Christmas, through the eyes of Joseph, and Christmas through our own eyes, be different for us and for those who surround us. And those who journey with us in this Christmas season, when they show up in this place, may they too also come to that notion that this is Emmanuel. This is God with us and through us and changing the world because we decided that even in the midst of doubt, there is a bigger picture that we have not yet seen come to fruition. I pray that you will journey with us in this Advent season and that through the eyes of the various characters we'll see ourselves and we too will be born again this Christmas time. Let us pray. Thank you, loving and gracious one, for eyes of doubt. And thank you for allowing us to see ourselves in that same Christmas story. We acknowledge, loving and gracious one, that there have been moments in our own lives where we have doubted your leading. We have doubted that you would really have our best interests at heart. We have doubted ourselves and others have poured even more doubt upon us. But we thank you that in this example of Joseph and Mary, that by running the course, by staying true to what we believe and what they believe that God has called them to, that your plan came to fulfillment. May we as your people this day, in our own doubt, may we too follow the plan, follow our dreams, follow our passion so that your plan would come true in us this day. And now I pray, God, that you would take the words that have come from my mouth, not allow them to return to you without bringing to us comfort, without bringing to us encouragement, without coming to us this day, so that we might follow in the pathway of Joseph. To the honor and glory of the one that's birthday, we celebrate this time, Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tracy, and I'm a board member on duty. Um, before I start, you know, I wanted to say something. You know, um, I'm not much of a public speaker. Um, in fact, one of my biggest fears is standing up here in front of people. And, <laughs> and this morning I got up this, with a horrible headache. I mean, it was like everything was being thrown at me this morning so that I wouldn't come up here. And um, <laughs> it was horrible. I mean, I, and I still have it, but it's not nearly as bad as it was to the point to where I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> And, you know, I was sitting in service this morning uh, at the 9 o'clock, and, I mean, I had my head down, I, you know, I had my hands on my head, and, and uh, poor Patrice was sitting there trying to make me feel better. <laughs> and I was just a mess. Um, but, you know, that, that's the devil, you know, trying to steal your joy. But, like, this is one of my biggest fears, you know, is standing up in front of people, and here I am. So I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> But what I'm going to talk about is what MCC is to me. And of course, I have notes because I don't remember anything. So, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I first came to MCC in 1997. I had just moved to Tallahassee, Florida to attend Florida State University. Go Knowles. <laughs> um, I was fresh out of the Marine Corps, and having just been medically discharged, I was unhappy. I was all alone, me and my dog. Um, I was struggling with my sexuality. My closest friends, whom I had stayed with for about six months after driving cross, cross country, had just left for Okinawa, Japan for three years. And my life was a total mess. I had grown up in church my entire life and had attended church consistently all the way up until my discharge from the military. I was very active in my church to include singing in the choir, which of course I do now, but had never really fit in. Something was missing from my life. When I moved to Tallahassee, I was trying to find myself and figure out who I really was. I hated the person I was. I hated the way my life had been up until that point and not feeling comfortable enough in my own skin to be me. I fought really hard to change my attraction to women, fought for years, but to no avail. I remember getting down on my knees in my living room um, one night and praying to God to put me out of my misery that God couldn't possibly love me. Uh, I was at an all-time low in my life. I felt like I was in this deep hole and couldn't find my way out, and I just wanted to die. Then, and this is so no joke, um, an amazing thing happened as I was down on my knees in that hole. I heard a voice. And the voice kept saying to me over and over again, God loves you no matter what. And of course, like most people probably would, I started crying. Um, probably cried more than I've ever cried in my entire life that night. And then I got up. Things changed for me in a big way. After that experience, I went in search of a church. The internet was fairly new back then. Yes, I'm a lot older than I look. <laughs> I got on the internet and typed in homosexuality in the Bible and began reading everything I could on the subject. I prayed to God to lead me to a place where I could worship and be me. And, you know, as I was doing my research, I kept seeing references to this church that was open to LGBT and decided to see if I could find a church that was nearby. I was blessed to find a local church called Gentle Shepherd Metropolitan Community Church right there in Tallahassee, Florida. Not far from my house, even. <laughs> I was scared to death the, time I first, uh, the first time I walked into that church but it didn't last for long. I had never ever felt so welcomed as I did that day. It was like I was finally home. Even after I moved to Southern Georgia a year later, I kept going to that church until I discovered another MCC close, closer. Not only did MCC change my life, it saved it. Thank you. That's right. Now, I know there are many of you out there just like me who found MCC. And in order to have this wonderful place where we can be ourselves, we need your tithes and offerings to keep our doors open. So please give as you are able.
Larry Mode is coming to play for us this morning, but before he does, I just want to say publicly in front of everybody, Larry, thank you for all that you do for the music department here at MCC. Thank you for your gift of music. Larry is a... Um, Larry is not only a gentle spirit, he makes me giggle when some of you don't see up here with the things that he does and plays, but he, is, he has a wealth of hymnity knowledge, knowledge of old hymns, which is un unbelievable, unmatched. So I'm so thankful that you're in my life and that you're here with us. Larry Mode. Let us pray. God, 
Thank you for these gifts that you have given us. Help us to use them to continue to show your love and to help those less fortunate, especially as we go into this holiday season celebrating your son's birth. In Jesus' most precious and holy name we pray, amen. amen. So, doubt. I'm actually a big, big fan of doubt. <laughs> Doubt means a lot of things. Doubt usually happens for me when my understanding of God has met its limits. And what I thought I knew no longer works. So it forces me to do something I hate doing, grow. <laughs> it forces me to expand my knowledge of what God and how God works in my life, how that actually occurs. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Having doubt, I read this this week, having doubt means that you care enough about your faith to wrestle with it. So it's okay having doubt. That's what brings us to the next level. It's how we know the rubber is meeting the road on our faith. When something happens, oh, by the way, Joseph, I'm pregnant. <laughs> WTF? <laughs> Which, by the way, stands for where's the faith? <laughs> How many of us have had those moments when we are filled with doubt because something has just been dropped out of the sky onto us and we have our where's the faith moments. Faith in ourselves to get through it. Faith in other people. Are they gonna be there to support me? Faith in my community. Are they gonna think I'm crazy because I wanna become a pastor? They may. Families, who knows? We go through these times of doubt. I'm here to tell you doubt is okay. Doubt is okay. So I'd like for you to take all of yourself, the places where you're certain, the places where you're not so certain, and the places where you just flat out don't know nothing and you're doubting all the way. Take that to a moment of prayer right here. God, we know we can trust you enough to bring you all of our doubt. We know we can trust you enough that you will be there through our doubt, taking us to the other side, making sure we get through okay. God, when we can look at the world and see such wars, such poverty, such great need in the world, and maybe we even doubt your existence, maybe we even doubt you care. It's okay, we can take this to you, and you are big enough to hold it, to hold us, and to bring us through. Thank you, God, for these times in our lives when we wonder and we have to lean on the everlasting arms of you. Thank you for this meal where we can remember those moments where surely there was some doubt in your mind about what was going to happen next, but you gave it away. You gave it up. You gave it over to what was going to happen. Thank you for being who you were so that we could have this meal. Thank you for Nelson Mandela, who said, I am going to do what I feel is right anyway. Anyway, despite what people said. I thank you for the people who are watching this. I thank you for the people who are listening, each of whom are doing your part 
to be the best person you know how, despite all the things that might be coming your way. We know that you are with us in all of this, and we give thanks humbly and joyfully as we approach this table. In Christ's name, we thank you. Amen. Amen. I wish I could be like Tracy and say really profound things and not cry. <laughs> wow. It's incredible. I was listening to the sermon this morning and Neil kind of put something together that I had never really seen before, a link of how Joseph was chosen by God <laughs> and had the opportunity to move through his doubt and accept his role or to dodge the doubt and kind of, or with the doubt, I guess, and go another way. And what a great example for his son that he set, Jesus, who was given a call as well and could move through his doubt into his destiny or could have allowed his doubt to keep him from changing all of our lives in the whole world. And I thought to myself, there's something really profound about manhood. Being, being a man, embodied as a man. Now I'm a feminist and I'm not anti-men, but there's something very special about that kind of integrity and that kind of power which really touched me. And having been a female who's been abused by men, I always doubted that I could know powerful men and love them. And yet I can see a powerful man in Christ. I get to be in your presence, amazing men, and you may never have a conversation with me, you may never engage me directly, but the fact that you're here and you're good changes me. And I wanna follow the example that God set for Joseph, that Joseph set for Christ, that Christ set for us. So when he had gathered his people together, he took some bread from the table, he blessed it, and he said, this is my body that's given for you. It's gonna be broken. And that brokenness can make you whole. Similarly, he took a cup from the table and he described to people that this is like the blood that would be shed from him the blood that would come from the spear wounds in his side, the crown of thorns that was put on his head, the blood that would be shed for who he is. He asked each one of them to drink from that, to be changed, and every time that they do it, to do it in remembrance of him. And then a little while later, after he was resurrected and some folks came and told the disciples that they had seen him risen, Thomas, also known as Doubting Thomas, said, it's not until I see it for myself and I touch those wounds that I can believe. And Jesus is so compassionate, so unwavering, so unstirred by our doubt that he can even give us proof. So no matter what it is that we bring to this table today, no matter what brokenness, no matter what embodied powerfulness that we have, it's all accepted and it's all beautiful to Christ. So God, we ask right now that you would send your spirit to these elements, the wafer, the juice, that as we take your body and we take your blood, that you purify us that you make us into those people who choose to move through our doubt into hope, into faith. And we know that it's through your example that we can access the strength, the courage, the power, and the community to accomplish these things. In your many names, amen.
at Metropolitan Community Churches around the world, and certainly here, we serve what is known as an open and inclusive communion. That means you do not have to be a member of this church. You do not even have to be a member of a Christian organization. You are welcome. You don't even have to be here. If you're on the internet, here's a fantastic time for you to join us by taking some bread, some water, some juice, whatever you may have. It's not important what you use. It's important what you bring to it that makes the communion happen. Here's an opportunity for you to commune with us and people around the world. At Metropolitan Community Church, the way we do communion is we will take one of the wafers and we will dip, dip it into non-alcoholic grape juice and place that wafer on your tongue and give you a brief prayer of blessing. If you would like to have just the wafer or just the wafer and the juice without the blessing, that's okay. If you'd like to have the blessing without the communion part, that's okay too. Just tell your server, we're here to serve you. We wanna make sure no one feels denied. If you would like to participate in this, just between you and your God, with no human intervention whatsoever, there will be consecrated elements to your right, my left, over here on the side to which you can go anytime. This table is set, it is not ours. It is Christ's table for you. All that we ask here is that you follow the directions of the ushers. Will the acolytes and servers please come forward?
So friends, as we prepare to leave this place today, regardless of whether it is 2,000 years ago and Joseph, or whether it is 2,000 years later and marriage equality, or Russia, or the life of a grandchild, or wherever we are on the spectrum of life, never underestimate what your perseverance and your conviction of listening to God in your life will make a difference in the world today. In the midst of doubt, may we hold on to faith. Amen.
So as, ooh, that was almost the voice of God herself. <laughs> I told you miracles happen. Um, so remind yourself that there is refreshments in the courtyard directly after worship. Uh, remind you that Robin's out there if you would like to dedicate a Ponsedia. Uh, last week we dedicated the illumination and there are a couple of folks here today who weren't here last week so I want to thank them for their participation in, uh, in illumination. Uh, remember there's board members outside if you would like to talk about your pledge and commitment for 2014. There is a lot to do after worship. So now and to God's gracious mercy and protection each and every one of us is given and the blessing of God known as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit. Be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace. participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry, our extended fellowship. Whether you're tuning in from Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, or Zimbabwe, wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. All of the people you've just seen in this broadcast, not just the ministers and the choir, but every person sitting on those pews, we are here for you. So please, why don't you connect with us? interact with us. We have four ways you can do that. Telephone, email, Facebook, and Twitter. And all of those links are located at the bottom of every webpage of our website at mccla.org. With your help, we can not just continue, but expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. Be a video angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donate link located just under the support menu in the upper right corner of any page of our website. Your participation is very important. And I want to invite you to write to me and let me know how I can be in prayer and praise with you. Even though you are not here in our worship center, you are still a part of MCCLA. Email me directly at revneal at mccla.org. May God bless your life. And I look forward to welcoming you back many, many times to MCCLA and our weekly live broadcast. <laughs>